Ah, draft physics video. Uh, I figure I better make this now because I might not be able to later. Snow coming and whatnot. Well, snow happening. Uh, let's see. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it's usually bad news here. Snow. Um, uh, no electricity and all that crap. Uh, but anyway. So, um, I've been thinking about this whole velocity thing. Quite interesting when you really start to think about it. I'm really thinking about it just in terms of this idea of spinning something, just turning it around. And if it has a velocity, that's sort of a lot of um, change, and yet it's not realized as much of a change. I mean, even for the relativists who, who believe in length contraction, if you turned in their length contracted world, you would go from being you know, contracted in one direction to being contracted in exactly an opposite direction, and it would be, you'd go through this uncomfortable process, so you would imagine, of, you know, being compressed in, you know, one way, making, and then bulging again, and, I mean, I mean it's a, you know, it's a warp of some kind. You could imagine it as uncomfortable. Um... So, uh, velocity, as I see it, is something you acquire. Um, it's a force that you possess when you have it, and that it's a, a universal thing. Um, the whole frame thing kind of breaks down because it sort of means that I can't throw a baseball through the universe without it going through a bunch of frames and somehow, you know, um, uh, doing a bunch of diffracting of some kind to get from one frame to another and that it you know, it's not really going to be traveling the, the line I threw it at. And um, I'm also kind of a believer that the universe, there's one universe. <clears throat> that the little bits inside of us are in the same universe as the big bits. And, um, you know, we just have this illusion of a separation between the two universes. And it's just that, an illusion. It's not a, it's not real. Um, just as dark inside, <laughs> you know, as it is out there, um, and um, desolate, and all of those kinds of things. So, uh, but my idea would be is that velocity is like um, your storing force. So it's like a storage mechanism. You're, you're like a spinning wheel, except the they're like say on a road, but but the road can only hit from the bottom. It can't come up from the top. In other words, you can't go this way. You can only go one way. The force will only let the 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 battery can only drain in one direction. <clears throat> so it's like a spin, and you say, "Yeah, but you can only release the spin this way." <clears throat> it's like having Earth in an orbit and saying, "You know, you can you can spin the Earth all you want, but when you release it, you can only release it that way." Yeah, you know, on one side of the curve, and that's. Um, sort of my vision of what velocity is, is that it's not something you can destroy. You can't just spin around and change your velocity. You know, if you're moving this way, spinning won't stop you from moving that way. Um, but, um, and so it's, it's a permanent kind of thing. It's the thing that survives the spin, uh, the turning. So it's like, um, a glass of water, <clears throat> or, well, a glass of some sort of mixed fluid, uh, different colors, let's say. So when you turn the glass, you can see that the, the fluid doesn't necessarily pay any attention, because the tension breaks down, and the glass can turn without the inside of the stuff inside turning. And so I would argue that there's parts inside of us that obviously don't turn when I spin around in this chair. They're not paying much attention. <clears throat> so I was thinking about where that line might be. Obviously, my arms are paying attention. Okay, <laughs> they're sort of obligated. <clears throat> um, my liver, it's going to be obligated to go where the body goes. Um, but I was thinking maybe a blood cell in the fluid. That might not have to change its, its orientation. Um, I mean, the world around it will turn but it doesn't necessarily have to spin with it. So it can be, it can be going head first, ah, I'm going, and then it can be going tail first through the artery or the <laughs> blood vessel. Um, and it might not care. Um, 
might not be any obligation to change to to apply torque to it um, to change its um, orientation and um, <clears throat> so this gets down to the little elemental bits eventually like everything that's where everything's really happening is the little tiny nuclear stuff <clears throat> I'm have argue <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> <clears throat> It's not really something in my throat. It's like my throat has ceased to become a throat. <laughs> I'm being strangled from within. Um, demons or something. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so the little atoms and stuff. You know, what's their perspective? I mean, how bound to the exterior, the, the mechanism that's turning, are they? How obligated are they to turn molecularly uh, with the turning, um, you know? And, uh, I mean, you can sort of clearly understand, you can sort of perceive that, you know, as you go through more and more of these places where there's tension between two things, something that locks them together, you know, that can break, that you can see where the breaks might happen in those little systems and... and um, but you'd think that'd be very disruptive, you know, to have all these little bits of tension inside of us have to snap and reorient all the time. But then again, we evolved on this planet, so, you know, that's a condition of surviving on Earth, would be tolerating the fact that you will move through an environment, and no matter how straight a line you think you're walking, the Earth, <coughs> the orbit around the Sun, the orbit in the galaxy, the galaxy's orbit in the cosmos is all um, obliging you to constantly have a new orientation, in a sense to have little magnets inside of you that are turning, uh, twisting all the time. I mean, you could imagine if we were made of little magnets and they were oriented to the Earth's pole um, <clears throat> that spinning you would be a real problem because it would just start ripping everything to pieces as all the little magnets individually turned. Um, you know. Uh, but, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's an interesting quandary. Um, I mean, I had a theory of inertia and, um, I still have it. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not too concerned. Um, but um, it does it does create um, it does make it seem uh, more difficult to explain how you could have this much change without it meaning anything in terms of any kind of structural breakdown. Like everything just works. Ju I can spin around just fine, no problem. Part of the problem is is that any spinning we do is really slow compared to the speed of the the little bits. I mean, they're living in a much, much faster world than we're in. Uh, and it's not even just a relativity thing. <laughs> you know, although that, that would be part of it. The fact that we do have velocity has slowed us down, so to speak, in terms of perception or clock speed or any of that kind of nonsense. Um, <clears throat> but um, we're you know, it's it's just the the very fact that you know all the little bits are moving in this speed of light context, and compared to the speed of light, this turning is very very slow. Um, and I wonder how fast you could flip something, where um, you know the jolt might mean something to it. But then you're getting into centrifugal, you know, acceleration. And that kind of spoils that deal, um, you know, because you, tr you want to kind of just see what it would like to be instantaneously reversed without you having to accelerate half the, you know, the bits in opposite directions. Um, <clears throat> this acceleration is always much more noticeable. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I haven't, uh, I haven't resolved it yet, but it has... It's been useful in terms of it's stuff I hadn't thought of, and um, it, you know, and the idea of a, 
a one-sided spin um, is sort of necessary to the idea of having a gyroscope kind of thing. So I guess that's one way to look at it as gyroscopes. But, you know, if you had a bunch of gyroscopes and they were part of one big gyroscope, if you moved the one big gyroscope and turned it, the little gyroscopes probably wouldn't care. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to be bothered reorienting themselves. But the torque thing is the thing that just got me, because I was just thinking about the fact that when you're holding a, a wheel spinning, even a hard drive, and you move it, you can feel the torque of changing its position, flipping it. Flipping it, you'll feel the torque of doing that. It won't, it won't be a free thing you just did. And um, so it seems pretty impossible that all the spinning bits, the gyroscopes, if they were connected into the matter in some sort of rigid way, that there's any way you could reverse them without you feeling the torque of reversing them. So, um, I don't know if there's anything else I have to... I mean, I've just been dealing with just conceptually trying to, um, you know, uh, trying to resolve, trying to find a, a, a solution, <laughs> you know, that's, um, you know, it explains how you can carry so much mass and see that even the relativists believe in this kind of stuff, you know, that you gain mass when you gain velocity. <clears throat> and that it's a real thing that's happening. And so clearly I'm saying you're gaining this force, which equals to mass. Um, it's not held as matter, it's held as force. And it's force in one direction, the direction of this, this momentum, this inertia in a direction, this thing called velocity. So velocity is kind of like voltage, so you know the electric universe guys could could make something out of this in the sense that you're when you possess a velocity it's it's like holding the potential of electric potential you know it's um it's increased your your power <laughs> and um it seems clear that that's true um you know that you're carrying more mass especially in one direction. I mean, it's that the matter you have is obviously moving, and it's all moving in one direction, which means that it's it's obviously, as a probability, it's more likely to hit you going the way the velocity is going than the opposite direction. So it has like almost zero potential to harm you from behind <laughs> and and a huge uh, probability of hurting you if, if it's coming right at you um, so it's like it's all its mass is now pointed in the direction of that velocity and its mass in any other direction is a lot less tangible a lot harder to find you have to get you, you know you can't throw a 10 mile an hour baseball at a one going 30 miles an hour away from you. It, 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 the two masses won't have anything. To, they, they won't interact. Um, no mass potential. You have to throw something faster and faster and smaller and smaller. Um, all right. Anyway, that's a, probably another subject. Um, all right. Yeah. So it's it's just about this idea that the you know, that your your velocity doesn't care about how you're turning most of your matter. Most of the bits are getting turned, and yet the bits that matter, <laughs> the littlest bits, somehow aren't being turned. Because if they're the ones that are possessing, um, directing the force of your velocity, um, holding the key to it, however you want to say that, um, they obviously can't turn or you'd have a new velocity, uh, and you don't. Um, you just, it's like falling in, off a building, you know, you can go feet first, or you go head first, you know, and you're not going to feel that big a difference in terms of the falling 
either way. Um, I mean, there will be some difference, but yeah, it's just not that big a difference. And that's, again, the only reason why you're feeling a difference is because uh, you're accelerating. I mean, they call it free fall, but, you know, you're accelerating. Um, you're gaining force. You're gaining potential. Uh, I mean, somebody might argue you're converting it, but that's, I don't think that's true. <laughs> you know, um, uh, yeah, if you were converting it, that would mean you would have more um, potential the further away you were from a gravitational source. And it's like somehow you're, you've given up potential by moving closer. And, you know, there might be something to that, but... Uh, I don't think the answer lies there. Um, so anyway, it was just a curious, um, you know, the distinction between the physics of acceleration, you know, the acquisition of velocity, and sort of like the idea that, you know, we're accelerating, but the fact is we don't really, we don't accrue velocity now. We just keep accelerating, and then we get pushed back up, and then we accelerate, and then we push back up. Um, so we're bouncing, essentially, but we don't feel that much. I mean, we certainly feel something's happening. Um, but yeah, the acquisition of velocity is clearly a different kind of process than the possession of it. So a battery filling up is different than a battery full. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a, certainly a more aggressive process to put the energy into something, like gasoline, uh, than it is to just store it. The storage doesn't seem to have a consequence. Um, doesn't seem to... Um, make itself known as aggressively as the process of releasing and acquiring. Acquiring. That's a good word for acceleration in both A words there, you know. Acquiring. Velocity. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, I keep saying anyway. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I've just been sleep thinking about this and <laughs> you know, so I haven't, I haven't got there yet, but um, just thought I would throw it out there. Um, I don't know. Well, here, here's, you know, I might as well just do a brief one on the what I'm speculating. I, I've sort of pointed this out before, but what I'm speculating to be the way um, your velocity is stored um, in matter, and so it. it I think it's stored uh, in atoms, and essentially it's stored in the sense that the force is acquired between these uh, electrons, and so the electrons establish a current. And the point is, is what they do is, you know, through their magnetic forces, they thicken these these forces, and because there's more matter, like more bits, so more electrons involved on one side of the equation than the other side of the equation, there's a potential in this direction because more of the matter is force bound on one side than it is on the other side. More of the relevant nuclear bits. And because of this current there would be likewise a similar increase in this kind of stuff and that would you know between the protons and the electrons um, but that's the idea of the wheel so you're spinning a wheel that has more mass on one side than it has on the other side you're you're pushing a current well I use the idea of a paddle wheel or something you have more paddle wheels on the stream on one side than you have on the other side and so the water is pushing more mass in one direction 
than it is in the other direction. And it's really about this idea of pushing mass, pushing the material that is you in the direction you need to go because all your bits are moving in that direction. And um, so, but it just gets, <clears throat> so saying that each one of these atoms is essentially a, a local field kind of solves the problem. You just say, well, it's a local field, kind of like the blood cell in the fluid. And if the fluid spins, the blood cell has discretion. It doesn't necessarily have to spin with it. So you could argue that these, these collections of momenta can be associated with each other and everything can spin and they'll just move around each other but they all still carry the same potential um, to move a lot of a lot of mass that away if this square breaks down if this circle breaks the break will mean more like if, if I were to kill these little lines I mean if I was to kill the relationship between, between these things and so you would just go based on what the last force was affecting something the point would be is that these would all have velocities in this direction and you'd only have one bit with velocity in the other direction so that's the point I'm making is that when you break it more matter will be going this way than it's going these other ways. Um, and that's also conservational and makes sense. Um, so, but it's just where does the where where does the tension, the torque, the bonds get liquid enough, get weak enough, where you could rotate things around each other by spinning something. So even though this pen theoretically is moving whatever a thousand miles an hour on the surface of the earth, I can rotate it. It's still moving a thousand miles an hour whatever direction the rotation is. And, you know, and that part doesn't change. It's still moving this way, even though I keep turning it head to foot, head to foot, head to foot. Even though one minute it's you know what I'm saying, its head's pointing that way and then the next minute its tail is, the next minute its head is, and the next minute its tail is. And what's moving inside here, and what's not moving inside here? What goes, what gets rotated, and what just spins where it is, and just ignores the rotation? Yeah. So, so what's, <laughs> yeah, sorry, there's got to be a better way to do this. I mean, there's got to be a better, I guess that's what I'm seeking is a metaphor. You know, eddies in a stream don't really work. Um, you know, because they are always in kind of quiet places. Uh, I mean, next to aggressive places, but they're always quiet where they are, and they're just peacefully spinning in their little local um, area. And <clears throat> so I suppose that works in some sense where you could say each atom has a local environment, and it doesn't, it isn't, its bonds to the other atoms is just a vague bond, like a weak force, a weak gravity. And it's not going to be obligated to um, change its routine in that weak gravity. I guess you could argue that the moon going around the sun isn't very affected by the fact that it's, you know, there's more, it's getting more gravity from the sun on one side of its orbit than the other side because its orbit is too narrow for the difference to matter. Um, so it sort of doesn't care, and then it doesn't care about the rotation around the solar system. Um, but obviously inside of the moon, if you were to break all the bonds at once, just break its connection to the Earth, and break its connection to the, to the, to the solar system, and then break its connection to the galaxy, it has an absolute velocity that is the combination of all those force acquisitions, or whatever you want to call them. <sighs> yeah. So anyway, well, I have to do more thought on it. I mean, it's just, it gets very complicated, because there's just, there's people spinning in chairs, uh, you know, on a platform that's spinning. 
on another platform that's spinning, on another platform that's spinning, and it's, you know, it's pretty hard to figure out what parts care about what other parts are doing at all. So anyway, that's, I guess that's, it's just, a, it's a depth question, but I mean, once you start thinking about that apple to the earth is an atom, you know, you know, to an apple, you know, you start realizing that these little bits are so separate from what this big bit is doing, what this body's doing, <laughs> you know, there's, there's about, you know, I mean, look, I, I, an apple to the earth, I have, and I'm made of how many apples? You, you know, uh, 10,000? Well, no, it couldn't be that many. 1,000 apples, let's say. You know. So that's, you know, earth to apple. <clears throat> Atoms to apple. So I got a 1,000 times that whole earth to an apple thing, 1,000 times. I mean, it's just a, you know, the grain, the granularity of the sand. You know, sand's probably a good metaphor. <clears throat> you know, the sand shifts so, so poorly. I mean, the bonds between the little grains breaks down so quickly. So you could, you could sit something in the middle of a pile of sand, and then you could have that in a bucket of <laughs> inside a bunch of. I mean, you could spin the bucket. The thing in the middle just sits there. And says, "I'm not noticing anything." So anyway, <clears throat> yeah. So it's just a. I mean, it's not necessarily a pleasant distraction to have to think on this. <laughs> there was other subjects I wanted to work on, um, but it still is 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 tremendously related to this whole subject of what's happening with light and the speed of light and being able to measure <clears throat> to establish that a a photon is something we know to be, say, universal. That it has no, it has it has no identity issues. Uh, it does one thing, moves in a straight line in one direction. And and the whole question of why we can't produce this this perfect thing um, <clears throat> perfectly. <laughs> you know, anytime we try to shoot one straight, we can't do it. And maybe that's just because the gun is moving too much. And so we just never can do it because we're always shifting our velocity, which is shifting the... And the little bits aren't moving with our movement. So they're staying oriented where they're going. And we're turning them, pretending we can shoot light this way, when the little bit is saying, I didn't do that. <laughs> something like that. And so every time we change the the trajectory of our absolute inertia velocity, it's constantly changing and as it constantly changes, it constantly changes the the aim of the gun, so to speak, the orientation of the electrons. Yeah. And uh such. Yeah, okay. So, then this kind of, yeah, draft science kind of a video, because I'm still thinking on it.